Hey there, party people. It's your boy Archlich, but you can just call me Archie, and today I have a rather special little lecture for you. Today we'll be talking about the feared and powerful Death Knights. These creatures are some of the most underused baddies you can find, and I often am disheartened to see that they are regularly relegated to playing second fiddle to the real bad guy in our games out there. But I do hope that today's information will inspire more of you wicked schemers out there to let our evil friends truly shine as they live up to their potential. Now even though I'm partial to liches as the ultimate masters of undeath for obvious reasons, I feel sorry for my martial counterparts as many have forgotten their deep and rich heritage as powerful and intimidating villains in their own right. However, I believe this has been enough moping around, and it's time to show what these undead scions of sin can bring to the table. So without further ado, let's get into it. Death Knights are very iconic creatures that exist within the D&D universe. They're very evocative of themes that one might associate with creatures like the Nazgul from Tolkien's works, and are appropriately powerful to boot. They were first introduced to AD&D in 1981, in a release by TSR called the Fiend Folio, which stated that these were fallen paladins that were corrupted by some dark entity of evil, likely a demon lord of some kind. Originally, it was posited that there were only 12 of these creatures in existence, and they were quite scarier than their neutered counterparts we see in modern D&D. Some notable features that were lost between now and then are being immune to turning, having a spell resistance of 75%, meaning that they would only be affected by any spell cast at them on D100 rolls of 76 or higher, summoning demons, and the almighty power word kill, although they also had access to other power word spells as well. Since then, they've been staple bad guys showing up as baddies fit for making any group of heroes quake in their boots while they piss themselves in fear. While almost nothing is provided lore-wise about these creatures in the modern Monster Manual, an important aspect of Death Knight lore that I like to keep in mind when designing them is that they usually are bound to a place of some kind, either by their own free will or perhaps in relation to the curse put upon them during their fall. Something that I think is often glazed over by many DMs in the space is that we often fail to realize the amazing potential for role-playing and storytelling that a Death Knight possesses. In fact, I don't think I could even make a video about Death Knights without mentioning the infamous Lord Lauren Saw, in all likelihood the most famous Death Knight in Dungeons & Dragons lore. While getting into all the stuff that Soth has done would likely take an entire video of its own, I'll at least give a little bit of info to wet the whistles of any who might be woefully ignorant in regards to the exploits of this magnanimous figure in the setting. Listen well, Acolytes, as Soth can likely be a very good inspiration off of which you can build your own arch-villains. Soth was once a noble knight of Salamnia, a kingdom in Dragonlance, however, for reasons, he decided to become a massive dick along the way. This all culminated in him cheating on his wife, being a massive dick and murdering said wife for a new elf girl he fell in love with. Then he got manipulated by a bunch of elven wenches whilst on a quest to save the world in penance for being a douchebag, and rather than focusing on the big picture and a textbook example of projection, he immediately was convinced that his wife was cheating on him, murdered the wenches, and went back home to bitch at his wife for cheating on him rather than saving the world. Smart. Everyone died in the midst of an argument, but Soth was more than rightfully cursed to suffer for an eternity as a death knight until he found redemption. What an idiot, right? However, there are a lot of really cool stories that Lord Soth gets involved in, and I would heartily suggest looking into the story involving him getting stuck in Ravenloft and beefing with Strahd and the gang. Anyhow, that's enough about Soth. Perhaps we'll go into more depth in another video, but for now, let's get to the topic of this video, which is actually running a Death Knight. First, let's talk about the story behind a Death Knight, as this will be very important to how they operate and how they might be dealt with permanently. The fall of a Death Knight is integral to their character, where they reside, and how they might be redeemed in order to put them away for eternity. Setting up any good Death Knight will require a good backstory providing context to their tragic fall from grace, and it's important to ask yourself a few key questions when you're doing your initial writing. First, how did they fall? Every Death Knight should be attributed to a tragic fall from grace. Some great moral failure akin to a Shakespearean tragedy should be the pretext for these creatures. It's important to understand that these people are miserable, as they are cursed to an eternity of depression and lonely hatred. Keep this in mind when considering how they act and how they think. This will be important, as it will establish the basis of their story, as well as any orders that they may be connected to. Second, why did they fall? This will establish their motives, personality, weaknesses, and their particular values. Thirdly, where did they fall? This is important for figuring out where their creepy evil base is going to be located. We'll talk about setting these up later. Unless they have business elsewhere, they are likely bound to this place and are not off to get up to much unless they're quarreling with local municipalities for some reason. 
Although it's likely that their lairs will be remote keeps that are often avoided by anyone traveling the region, they should likely be rumored by locals to be cursed places best left be. Fourth, it's important to consider when they fell. This will tell you how old they are. Was the country the same when the knight was alive as it is now? The older they are, the less known the history around these figures is likely to be known as well. Also, are they culturally the same as the people that may inhabit this region now? All of this will likely influence the gods they served as well. With these aspects fully fleshed out, I think this should help you get a good picture of your Death Knight and who they really are. I think it's very important to stress the identity of the Death Knight during creation as it is often their pride and other personal faults that led them to becoming the dangerous monstrosities that they are now. Now all you need is a cool name and you'll be set. Now that we've got our tragic edgelords fleshed out with a backstory something along the lines of killing their whole family because their mom spat on their katana or something, we can now get to the nitty gritty of their stats and rather simple tactics. Before we get into it, I think it's important to stress that I am going to do as much as possible to buff these guys up with items and the like as their stats in 5th edition are very underwhelming in comparison to what they used to be. They end up being pretty damn scary by the end, so if you decide to tone it down, feel free to do so, I won't take any offense, but I'm gonna roll with it because I know that my players can handle it. That being said, let's take a look at their base stat block to get an idea of what we're working with. Death Knights come in with a decent high level AC of 20. Keep in mind that this is when they have their shield out, so not if they're two-handing their longsword. They have 180 hit points if you're taking average rolls and a movement speed of 30 feet. They have Stellar Strength coming in at 20, a normal deck score of 11, Stellar Constitution coming in at 20, Above Average Intelligence at 12, Good Wisdom at 16, and a very good Charisma of 18 to reflect their Paladin lineage. For saves, our bone boys have good wisdom and charisma saves with a throwaway plus 6 save for decks, which likely won't help them too much with their deck saves since they're wearing plate armor. They sport immunity to necrotic and poison damage, and they are immune to the exhausted, frightened, and poisoned conditions. For senses, they get dark vision for 120 feet. I think this is bullshit, so I'm going to make this true sight to be in line with their old abilities to see invisibility at will. These guys are supposed to be the liches of paladins, so they should have true sight too. For languages, they come default with Abyssal in common, but I would argue that this is subject to change based off of who they were in life, so Elven Death Knights, for example, would know Elvish. Two unique features that they have are Magic Resistance, which they will need to help them from whiffing saves since many of their saving throws are garbage, and Martial Undead to make the undead around them more resistant to turning. They're also considered 19th level Paladin for spellcasting purposes, which means they have access to a pretty solid set of spells that'll come in useful in most combat situations. While they don't have access to the high tier spells you would have seen in older editions like Power Word Kill, I don't think we need to necessarily give them access to these in order to make them a formidable foe. Getting into actions, we see that the Death Knight gets a pretty spicy multi-attack that has three attacks in it, along with a pretty decent bonus to hit, and they get the only scary thing that Wizards of the Coast decided not to neuter from it. A 20 dice fireball, with half the dice being necrotic damage. The Hellfire Orb is pretty scary, and it can really be useful when you blast the entire party with it. Lastly, and certainly the least, our Emo Knight has a parry as a reaction that allows it to add its proficiency bonus of 6 to its AC against one melee attack that it sees being made against it. This is a decent throwaway ability if you don't anticipate you'll be making any attacks of opportunity during the round. While it doesn't add too much to survivability or anything, it's still helpful, so why not? But now that we've got the stats out of the way, let's look at what we can do to make running them memorable and a more challenging experience. First, it's going to be important to look at modifying their stat block a little bit. Now I know this is the first time I've done this in a video, but I believe that these baddies are woefully under-equipped to be really scary big bad guys. And it's almost like they were designed to be more powerful henchmen for the real bad guy. But don't get your panties in a twist, as I'm not going to completely retool their kit. The changes I'm going to make are pretty simple, but still effective. First, these guys should really have legendary actions and resistances. I'm going to give them three legendary resistances and three legendary actions. The legendary resistances are pretty self-explanatory, and here are the three legendary actions I came up with. The first is simple. The Death Knight just gets to make an attack, costing one legendary action. The second is to exhibit their aura of dread that is painfully missing from their actual stat block in this edition. Basically, I'm going to give them a dragon's frightful presence, but at their spell DC. So the Death Knight can choose any creatures within 120 feet, and they have to make a wisdom save against the Knight's spell save DC. If they fail, they're feared for one minute, or until they pass the recurring save at the end of their turns. Furthermore, they are immune to this for the next 24 hours after it ends. This is going to cost two legendary actions. Third, and lastly for the legendary actions, I'm going to give the Death Knight a legendary action titled March of the Damned. 
For three legendary actions, the Death Knight can emit a torrent of foul necrotic energy, allowing it to select any amount of humanoid corpses within 60 feet and raise them as either skeletons or zombies based on the condition of their body. This can also target previously slain undead for the same effect as long as they haven't been disintegrated or otherwise destroyed. I think this is a very cool ability that can be used to turn the Death Knight into an undead general leading a horde of undead, raid boss style. This allows them to be powerful warlords that gather more and more followers the more death and destruction they spread. Almost like a force of nature that doesn't have to pay attention to the normal rules of warfare. The more pain, the more suffering that they spread, the more powerful them and their armies become, and this makes the Death Knight fearful indeed. The final feature I'm going to tack on to the Death Knight stat block is going to be the passive ability from the Oathbreaker Paladin subclass titled Aura of Hate. This gives the Death Knight and any fiends within 10 feet of the Death Knight a bonus to damage rolls equal to the Death Knight's charisma bonus, which is 4 in this case. Big note, this applies to all fiends and undead within 10 feet, not just allies. This will also further the whole Dreadlord Undead General vibe we're trying to go with, and it'll really go a long way to helping our Bone Boy get some calcium. With all of this applied to the base stat block, I think we're really looking a lot better than we were before. It already feels way more like a boss monster with these new abilities, and we're just getting started. Now let's move into the equipment section, and start pimping our legendary Death Knight out with some sweet magic items. These will be fun. They're likely going to be evil and cursed to all hell, since our edgelord is very likely to have some evil god shit in his inventory. Or good god shit that got corrupted by them doing evil things to get cursed. Now to get started, any good legendary fallen paladin should have a legendary sword. This will not only make them terrifying in combat, but it can also even be used as a plot device written into stories and legends, which could help the virgin nerds of the party who read a bunch of old books to learn about our evil overlord. You can go with any legendary weapons in the book, but I'm going to give our evil bad guy a little homebrew weapon here. I'm giving him an evil version of the Holy Avenger. It's important to understand that a Death Knight is more defined by its story and narrative than most creatures you'll see in the book. To do them justice, they should be fallen warriors of legendary proportion. Think like the story of King Arthur and Excalibur levels of significance. In fact, if you recall what I mentioned earlier, Death Knights were originally restricted to there only being 12 in existence. All legendary fallen paladins, so. I think this addition will give them a richer backstory and history, as you can describe in length their quests in ancient times to find the Holy Avenger of the Gods in order to save the land from the very evil they have fallen to so many years later. Make sure to give the blade some form of super intimidating evil name befitting its reputation. I'm going to name our sample blade Kingslayer. Rather simple, but good in my opinion. Here are the features of Kingslayer. Firstly, it requires attunement by an evil creature. It gives a plus three bonus to attacks and damage rolls. When you hit a living humanoid or celestial with it, it takes an extra 2d10 necrotic damage. And while holding the sword drawn, it creates a 10 foot aura that gives all creatures hostile to you disadvantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. If the creature wielding this blade is 17th level or higher, it's a 30 foot radius. So for our boy, it is a 30 foot radius. With this legendary sword in hand, Baby Soth now has a bonus to hit of 14, and and a plus eight to their damage on each hit. Along with the abilities we gave our Death Knight, he's finally starting to look a little scary, but don't worry, we're just getting started. Keep in mind, a Death Knight is a legendary powerful creature that has likely been around for a long time. I would argue that he should have access to pretty much any magical items a marshal would want. Feel free to take some of these items away if you think he's a little too stacked, but I personally want this guy to be ready to throw hands with a high level party enough to still manage to put the fear of God in them. With that being said, let's take a look at what I've given him. So for armor, I'm going to give our Death Knight a plus three adamantine plate armor set. This is going to make him immune to crits, and it's also going to give him a plus three to his AC. While we're at it, let's also give him a plus three animated shield. Keeping track of attunement slots, we have one attunement slot remaining. Also keeping track of our Death Knight's stats, we should be looking at his AC, which is very high, admittedly. It'll be sitting at a disgusting 26. Now keep in mind that this AC is still very high in the game, but when you're dealing with high level players, you're looking at probably them having somewhere in the ballpark of a plus 14 to hit with their attacks. Considering how many attacks they're going to be throwing out, it's not unlikely that they're still going to be able to consistently deal damage to our creature. Now we have a choice to make. There are two items that I think would be perfect picks for our third attunement slot. If you want to be a dick, go with a Cloak of Displacement. Combining this with your already ridiculously high AC is going to make this guy a nightmare to fight without trying to nullify the magical effects of the equipment our DK is rocking. 
If you want to be slightly less of an asshole, you can always give them a belt of giant strength. I'm gonna go with a belt of storm giant strength because our death knight is a legendary bad guy and he isn't some bitch that isn't going to be decked out in super powerful magical items. Keep in mind, if you go for this item, he's gonna hit like an absolute truck and his chances of hitting whoever he's swinging at are quite high because this will boost his bonus to hit to 18. Out of these two items, I'm going to personally go with the Cloak of Displacement. I think I like this choice better because this is obviously going to be a higher CR creature than what it is in the base book, and I'm banking on this baddie facing off against a level 15 to 20 party. This means we're likely going to be looking at our players having somewhere in the ballpark, like I mentioned earlier, of 14 to hit with their attacks, assuming they have magical items. With these attacks, the players are going to likely have a roughly 2 in 5 chance of hitting with each attack, and while this seems bad on the surface, keep in mind that at late levels our parties are going to be able to throw out a lot of attacks, and our boy only has 180 hit points, so we need to make sure that he's hard to hit. With all these buffs, our DK is now actually terrifying. This will allow for a really cool moment when your overconfident ass players stroll up in their legendary gear acting all high and mighty. They'll pull up on our baddie expecting him to be like the bitch made death knights in the base book until the fighting starts. Once everyone starts throwing hands, we'll get to allow our edgelord to have what many anime connoisseurs refer to as a reverse jump moment. If they come in too unprepared or too unexperienced, the fight should play out something akin to when Thanos beat the shit out of everyone in the beginning of Infinity Wars. If the players really underestimate our anime villain, they may even get some of themselves killed in the process. Which will also go a long way to make this villain less of a whining, mildly challenging enemy, and more akin to Darth Vader like he should be. Which, in normal people words, means that this villain will be enriched as a long-term adversary to our adventurers due to the experiences that the players have had facing it. The respect and fear that this enemy will evoke from them going forward will make the character much more titular and meaningful when he appears in the game. You'll find that your players will take this villain a lot more seriously after he's beat their ass and sent them crying home with a couple of dead players to boot. Which will make our villain a more complete and meaningful character that'll have your players sitting up straight and leaning in whenever he appears. This is exactly what we want, and I think these additions we've made are fitting to get our Death Knight up to snuff with what he should be according to the lore. The only note I would include, on the end of this at least, is that you should adjust the CR accordingly. I'm lazy, I would probably just put this guy at a CR 22 and call it a day, but if you go by the DMG G rules for CR, this guy's going to be through the roof compared to his base stats, so be ready for that. With the stats out of the way, I think it's high time that we start talking about putting together a dope-ass lair for our Death Knight. The focus of any Death Knight base should always be the thematics. This is where you need to get out your pros and start making sure you write a breathtaking description of the cursed lands that this Champion of Darkness resides in. Make sure to describe things in detail, not only by how they look, but make sure to describe the palpable atmosphere of dread that hangs over the land. Perhaps use descriptions to describe how the color is drained from your surroundings, and it feels almost like the air itself is hostile to your lungs. Perhaps the sun barely shines, and whatever light seems to peek through the darkened sky seems to lose its golden hue. Go wild, and go all out, as the DK really relies on this ominous presence to enrich their character. They're edgy, and their aesthetic is their gimmick. While a Death Knight can theoretically be bound to any type of location you can think of, I always like to go with the old classic isolated ancient fortress. I usually like to place them somewhere inhospitable like frozen mountaintops or perhaps cursed lands so suffused by the horrible evil that inhabits this place that the dead rise and ghosts haunt the abandoned villages that dot the area. Really, your imagination is the limit here, so just write the most grimdark shit you can think of and it will likely be good. Fighting a Death Knight should begin long before the party reaches his castle. The very landscape itself should be bare and inhospitable, and the party should likely have issues if they don't pack enough supplies. I would personally have the Outlander feature not even work here when trying to survive in the area as no food or drink can be harvested from these cursed lands. I also think it's a cool idea to make maps and such that the party could gather of the land to be inaccurate, if the Death Knight's old enough at least. In all likelihood, the party may have to leave the Death Knight's realm to replenish supplies and continue exploring for the dark fortress in which he resides. Speaking of residing, another very important part of any Death Knight would be his followers. Death Knights are often in the command of many different undead, so take your pick from the different types of undead that may be under their command with time. Furthermore, their domain is likely cursed to shit, and the dead who aren't laid to rest and consecrated are likely to get up and start wandering around until they flock to the Death Knight's command. 
However, there is something that I think should be a staple of any Death Knight's armies, which is an evil order of knights. With the Death Knight as the Grand Master of their order, these evil knights serve him in return for power, and also in the hopes that they one day may become strong enough with the powers of evil to become Death Knights themselves. For their stats, you can just use Blackguard stats from Volo's guides. The only changes I would make would be giving them a couple different weapon setups to give them some variation. Otherwise, they should likely have a literal army of undead defending their fortress and the surrounding lands. You could lean into the Evil Knight Order being elite lieutenants and have the Death Knight rely on its ability to raise the undead to bring armies to bear against the realms of men, something akin to the Night King from Game of Thrones. Now that we've got the army and the theme out of the way, let's get into some of the more material aspects of a fortress and how we should be running it without wanting to smash our heads into a brick wall. The first problem that I see with the running of a fort is that we're definitely not going to want to have to run an entire army of 8 billion zombies in an actual fight. While there are multiple ways to deal with this, I'm going to suggest that we treat the army like a set piece rather than trying to roll for all of them. If the players try to assault the place alone, you can give them some rudimentary horde mechanics, but I'm not going to waste time giving those stats to everyone. If the players attack the fort with an army, have the focus be getting through the bosses like the knights and some undead minions while the big movie style battle happens in the background. This will save you the headache of having to run an ass ton of monsters. Another thing worth considering is that the armies don't have to all be centered around there unless they are making a last stand of some sort, as they will likely be fighting with local neighboring counties or patrolling for scouts or other armies. This will give you some plausible deniability when the big spooky castle fight happens that allows you to avoid trying to run an army fight in a game not designed for that. And it'll also allow you to make the region as a whole more dangerous by allowing your players to encounter patrols and military camps at more than just the scary castle. I really like this approach as it allows us to make the region a hostile environment that almost acts as its own kind of adversary to the party. The region can then be used to evoke the vibe similar to going into the wilderness at RuneScape, which is to say, scary but exciting. Perhaps you can have the region have been cursed for so long that no accurate up-to-date maps exist, and with the terror the undead are wreaking upon the neighboring lands, the kingdom or other appropriate ranking nobility calls upon the party to adventure into these lands to learn more about the whereabouts of their foes. If this goes on long enough to keep the party's interest, you could even have them leading scouting efforts in the region with a bunch of rangers like some Lord of the Rings shit. Cool stuff. As for how the fort is built and manned, there are a couple of assumptions we should probably work off of. The fort was likely pretty impressive back in the day, but it has likely degraded due to disrepair unless your death knight particularly values the place rather than hating it, which is much more common. This means that some of the defenses might be degraded like walls being collapsed or gates being rotted, but the ones that are still intact are likely very solid and effective against invaders. While this likely won't matter against a party, this is something to be considered when armies are involved. Speaking of armies, most tactics of traditional siege warfare as we know it wouldn't be very effective, as they mostly rely on starving the enemy out, which would be a moot point against the undead, and due to the inhospitable nature of the environment, it's likely that a protracted siege would just result in massive attrition for the attacking armies. Furthermore, they'd have to keep consecrating the dead lest they start getting up and attacking their old comrades later. However, this changes when we get to the magic users. If you could get either siege monsters, casters with the ability to cast earthquake-style spells, or something else in this vein of thought, you can look at breaking down the crumbling walls of the castle to bring armies to bear against the forces of darkness. Most castles worth their salt back in the day had a couple of similarities. They usually had multiple layers of walls to allow the defenders to layer their defense, but let's just be lazy and make the castle have three sections. It's probably a safe bet to say that our edgelord of darkness will be found at the center until he comes out swinging with his best Sauron's last stand upon Mount Doom impression. Castles are often built at a very defensible or remote location as well. They're usually hard to get to, like on a hill or along a mountain pass where you can only come from one direction. It's also important to talk about how the defenders would typically be arrayed. Skeletal archers should be expected to be manning the walls, along with zombies and ghouls being led by white sergeants. The knights in our Big Bad's evil order should be acting as the officers, leading the undead followers. Even if they're living, we can hand wave this by saying that their induction into the unholy order to which they belong gives them power over the mindless undead bound to the will of the Death Knight as long as our Death Knight exists. These should be the guys that our party has to get through in their adventures in order to have an easier time at the end just worrying about the big DK and not having to fight a bunch of elite knights with paladin spells at the same time. Zombies and other chaff should be focused in choke points as directed by their white sergeants who will be using them to plug the holes that come up in the defenses. Any ghosts or other undead ghoulies that are able to be more mobile will likely be used to attack the back lines of any invading forces. The castle would likely have some sort of heavy weapons of its own as well. 
While you could go with pretty much whatever you like, such as ballistae, catapults, trebuchets, or burning oil, I like to give the castle a bunch of trebuchets that are loaded up with the corpses of the people that the armies have killed in their different campaigns. The fresher, the better. Splatting the corpses of their victims among the men in the siege lines. While this will have a massive demoralizing effect, they can also start rising come midnight and attacking the sieging forces, which would be pretty damn metal if you ask me. It's important to keep in mind that the Death Knight isn't a bitch, and will likely be wading through the feeble mortals foolish enough to face him, absolutely dumpstering them like a trained UFC heavyweight rampaging through an army of toddlers. So, if his home is under attack, you can likely guarantee he's gonna be on the front line once the fighting starts. Now with all that said and done, I think that's relatively comprehensive enough to cover the big spooky castle. So let's get into what a Death Knight should actually look like in a fight, and what tactics they might be using. First off, this guy is a nightmare in combat. He's rocking a colossal AC of 26, so he's going to be very hard to hit by anyone other than the party in all likelihood. And he's going to be slapping everyone with his plus 14 sword that he's two-handing because his shield can fly. Speaking of nightmares, he's probably riding one around. Keep in mind these things can fly, but in that super badass way where they run through the air and shit. These guys have stats in the monster manual, so feel free to grab those and have them fight alongside the DK. When it comes to how our edgelords fight, while it can vary between different personalities, generally the Death Knight is a simple man, woman, bone person. They're going to walk up to the party, and they're going to proceed to kick their asses. They won't be afraid to engage the marshals in melee combat, but if they need to deal with some pesky people in the back line, they won't hesitate to banish someone in their way while they attempt to deal with the others causing issues. Keep in mind that they have access to a pretty solid set of spells that can help them deal with different situations. Some examples might be, consider using command on annoying casters, telling them to end spells or stop people from doing something annoying in general. Compelled duel can be useful if our boy is interested in protecting allies or is just trying to keep people from running away. So when the Death Knight decides that their enemies are being pussies who won't stand and fight, throw this at them and make them square up like real chads. Don't forget to consider the hold person spell as well, as it will come in useful if we're getting bothered by certain players up to some shenanigans. Also worth noting that we have access to multiple different smite spells, which are all good for extra damage and some mild CC effects, so don't forget to slap those onto your sword for a swing or two. If it gets dogpiled by a bunch of opponents, our man DK can also throw out a destructive wave to send the ops flying. Also, never forget the big funny, Hellfire Orb, a 20 dice fireball that you get to throw at the party when they start grouping up. It's even better when a healer runs over to help a friend in need. If you're trying to look for a vibe or general disposition of the Death Knight and what it should look like to fight one, think about that scene in Rogue One where Darth Vader goes sicko mode on that poor rebel scum. Especially with the spells added in, well, yeah, it should kinda actually look like that scene. Also, make sure not to forget the sick-ass new legendary actions for this upcoming part, because another very important part of the Death Knight's game plan should be the undead minions that it comes rolling up with. With Martial Undead, along with the other sick-ass abilities we gave him, our Death Knight doesn't just shine as a monstrous combatant, but also as a leader that buffs all of his allies. He should be a scary-ass warlord that wields legions of the undead against the realms of the living, putting them all to the sword mercilessly. Keep our bad boy at the center of the action, leading his horde of undead against his foes. Raise the dead among his slain foes as he leaves naught but death and destruction in his wake. He should likely sick the minions on any casters or range players as our knight would likely wish to test his might against any frontliners that would deign to challenge him in combat. Don't forget about his knights, either. With the blackguards in tow, this fight could get really hairy. They should prioritize supporting the Death Knight in whatever way seems most sensible. It's likely they'll harry the spellcasters or healers to try and keep them from supporting the frontliners or nuking the lesser minions with the AoE spells as often. Keep in mind that these guys have spells and that can help them achieving this goal. With these abilities combined, our Death Knight should no longer be some second-rate stooge, and it will now play like a raid boss out there, hitting people harder than their alcoholic fathers, while also rushing the players with buffed-up ads that they have to deal with. Wait. Now that I think about it, maybe a Death Knight being a raid boss isn't that original. Anyways, there it is, Acolytes. I think that covers the Lich's Chad older brother who decided to hit the gym and was just so good at committing war crimes that they became immortal demigods without even having to spend 18 hours a day studying and taking out ridiculously predatory loans from the Merchants Guild to pay for wizard school. I hope you found this information from my archives useful, Acolytes, and I would caution you to guard this information at all costs, as it is important for any prospective necromancers to know the capabilities of their inevitable rivals. Make sure to put it to good use against those pesky adventurers that seek to stop you from your ascension towards your dark desires. But until next time, this has been your boy Archlich, and remember to never 
underestimate a death knight.